Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by my friend and former guest on the show, Mr. Chet Falzerano. Chet, welcome back on the podcast. It's great to be here. Thanks, Bart. I appreciate it. Yeah. So um, folks who listened to the podcast last week, this doesn't normally happen this fast, but this week it did. So <laughs> Lucas Von Gretsch was just on the show and we were uh, giving you, you know, praising you about your hard work um, for a lot of different things. But one of which is your uh, Chick Webb book and your your studying of the great Chick Webb, uh, who's really kind of a mythical man in the in the history of drums. And uh, what do you know? I emailed you and it was either now or never because you're going to be going out of town. So we we got you on in, <laughs> in a matter of days. So, yeah, I'm going off to Italy and the, the Internet in Italy is just terrible. So it's a good thing we did it before before. Yeah. Otherwise, we'd have to wait till I got back to Germany. Yeah, which, you know, we could do, but what, but I always say, why not do it now? Um, exactly. So, so I appreciate your quickness. And now people don't have to wait because literally like five, six days ago, people heard about <laughs> the possibility of an episode. So let's jump in. Let's learn about Chick Webb and what made him such a legend and uh, kind of a hero, really. Um, so take it away, my friend. I have to start off with his birth date. And that, that's been argued on, on several levels. Um, I I have his birth date as um, uh, 1909, um, but th th that's argued. There there there's also dates of 1905, and there's just various dates. But I go with 1909 because that's what's on his tombstone, and I figure that's yeah. got to be pretty correct, right? Yeah, yeah. But there's a census report that supposedly puts him um, uh, born at an at an earlier date, but. I don't really hold too much to census reports because they're full of a lot of errors. <laughs> Even the Census Bureau uh, cites the number of errors that they have. So hmm. I go with 1909. He was he was born in 1909. Shortly thereafter, as an infant, he fell down a flight of steps in front of his house and he crushed some vertebrae. The doctor prescribed him to uh, bang on pots and pans to improve his upper body strength. Wow. That obviously turned into something because he became a drummer. Yeah. Um, he, he had a, a paper route as a young boy, earned the, the money to, 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 to buy a, a, a set of drums. And he played in and around the, the Baltimore area. That's where he was born is in Baltimore. Well, that's fascinating right off the bat of like a doctor prescribing Banging on pots and pans. I mean, like, it's like a well, be, movie <laughs> because he 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 was he was in bed. He was bedridden, and 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 his mother said, you know, he, the doctor says he needs to improve his upper body strength. He needs to be, stay limber and, and 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 flexible. And his mother said, "How's how are we going to do that?" She he says, "Well, every kid loves to bang on pots and pans. Let him drum." So. That's how it all started. Yeah. Unbelievable. That's so yeah. cool. Good for the, 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 the history of drums in general. Uh, we can thank that doctor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. At least for Chick Webb we can. And then, uh, as I said, then he, 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 he bought a set of drums. He played in and around the, 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 the Baltimore area. His first gig was on the jazz, was with the Jazzola Orchestra on uh, the steamship cruises in Chesapeake Bay. And there he formed a relationship with uh, John Truhart, who was the banjo player uh, for the Jazz Ola Orchestra. And uh, they decided to, to make a, a, the move to, to the Big Apple. Chick was, was, was only 16 years old. And John Truhart was just nine years, was, was nine years his senior, which is quite a number of years, you know, for a, for, for, for a 16 year old than to be going with a 25 year old. Yes. You know, that's, that's quite a bit of difference. So they, they went to the Big Apple. He, uh, the, the two of them, um, located in, in Harlem in a one room apartment. And, uh, like all budding musicians, they had to prove themselves. And so they did that by going to jam sessions in and around the, the Harlem area. Hmm. Uh, one of the first uh, clubs that they went to was uh, Small's Paradise. And performing there was Duke Ellington. And in Duke Ellington's band was Johnny Hodges, which was also uh, Chick Webb's cousin. Hmm. So that also helped him, I'm sure, to get, get a start at, at Small's Paradise. 
also in Duke Ellington's band was a fellow by the name of, of, of Bobby Stark. And, and Bobby Stark was also playing in a band, um, Edgar Dowell's band in Harlem. Hmm. And Edgar Dowell was auditioning for a club uptown. And um, Chick went along with him to that audition. But Edgar Dowell's drummer was stuck on a subway. And so Chick was there with him on the audition. And, and, and uh, Bobby Stark said, hey, you know, I've got, I've got a drummer here that can do it. Well, uh, Edgar Dowell takes one look at little hunchback Chick. And, and, and he says, there's no way I'm putting him on my bandstand. So the, the, the club owners said, um, OK, it's time. And he said, well, can you give me can you give me a few more minutes here? My drummer w- will, will show up in a few minutes. And he says, well, I have time for bullshit. And he says, no, well, I've got another drummer. He can sit in until my drummer gets here. And he says, well, whatever, you know, go ahead. So uh, um, Chick Webb starts starts playing and it just wins over this club owner because Chick is just doing high sticking and twirling. And <laughs> and, 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 and besides being a very accomplished drummer because by he 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 was like an instant drummer he he um he he proved himself in in baltimore but then he also proved himself in in harlem and uh duke ellington was was his was his mentor Hmm. um and so um that was his first gig was was the edgar dowell band and it was just a fluke you know just he just just happened to be at the right time in the right place. Well, and and so you mentioned, I mean, you did talk about it, but just to kind of like uh, hone in on it a little bit, you mentioned his hunchback and he's kind of, I mean, he had like a uh, a handicap. I mean, he was a bit disfigured. And on your outline here, going back a little bit to his earlier days, you, I just want to touch on how you said in your outline, due to his contorted shape, friends called him Chick. And that would yeah. ex- explain that a little bit uh, more. Well, because because he uh, uh, had crushed vertebrae, his upper body was actually truncated. He was he was short on on the top half of his body. The lower half of his body was normal, but the top half of his body was truncated. And he also kind of uh, uh, moved in, in kind of a herky jerky manner. And so his friends, his 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 chums, called him Chick. They nicknamed him as as Chick. And that name stuck yeah. uh, on into for the rest of his life, as a matter yeah. of fact. Yeah. Um, and so, um, yeah, it, it, he, he was physically disabled, but, uh, but, but only from a, from a visual standpoint, because he was still able to play extremely well. I mean, he, his, his arms were normal, his legs were normal. Um, and so um, uh, he had to sit high on the set so that he could be seen above this big 28 inch bass drum yeah and that's that was the common bass drum of the of the day sure so to be seen above it he had to sit exceptionally high and um there's there's rumor of him of him having um extra pedal an extra board on his bass drum pedal so that he would be would able to uh, sit up high and, and be seen above the uh, above this huge bass drum, um, and still play play his yeah. fabulous way. I mean, he was just an, an incredible drummer. Yeah, I mean, I think Lucas in the previous in last week's Gretsch episode described him as battle mad, obviously referring to the drum battles, which we'll get to in a minute. But just in general, the like the like I'm gonna do it attitude, like nothing's gonna exactly. stop me. I mean, he was determined. Nothing stopped this man. I mean, he was just he was just hell bent for leather. It's it's really <laughs> incredible that he yeah. was able to 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 muster up that kind of courage and stamina. Uh, and meanwhile, being ridiculed, you know, he, even when, when when he was first getting started there in New York, when he was first getting started in Baltimore, I mean, everybody was was ridiculing him because of his appearance, yeah. because he was you know was they called him unfortunately it's a terrible word but they called him a midget and and you know that's um you know well i mean how, and how sad is that yeah and it's terrible but i think nowadays we live in a time where the any ailment you have uh which you, people can you know we live now in a moderate time of modern science where you can uh and i think people are a little more accepting now and politically correct but 
in the mid, you know, 19 teens or the 1920s. I don't think it was like that. Obviously, I think people were mean. I think you would be sent to like stay at a like like it, they, people would send their kids off to like live in like uh, you to know, asylums. To yeah. asylums. Thank to you. Asylums. And yeah. so, man, I mean, he he had everything against him and, and clearly he uh, he wasn't going to let it hold him down. I mean, if he's he's black. That that's a first strike against him. Yep. He's 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 got a he's got a handicap. You know, he's he's physically uh, uh, not attractive to look at, and so therefore, you know, people didn't want to hire him. Yep, yep. Until is, they realize how good he is, and then it, it he starts to win people over with his sheer talent. Not even then, you know. I mean, he wins people over like like uh, Duke Ellington. Who who just recognizes just a, a God given talent, you know, and 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 promotes him, and in fact, uh, Duke Ellington organized Chick's uh, first job as a band leader. He was playing at the Kentucky Club. Duke Ellington was. He was playing at the Kentucky Club, and the Black Bottom needed a band, and so um, uh, Duke Ellington said to him, "I've got a, a great band." And he said, uh, I'll, I'll talk Chick into doing it. Chick did not want anything to do with it. He just wanted to play his drums. He, he did not want to be a band leader. But, but um, uh, Bobby Stark and, and, and his cousin Johnny Hodges talked him into it. And so he formed the band, the Harlem Stompers. Hmm. And they played their first gig was at the Black Bottom. What does that entail to be a band leader as a drummer? Like, what would that would that be choosing the like writing out the charts, getting things set up? How, what would his job be as a as a drummer band leader? Well, that's what he didn't feel very confident in doing, and 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 that's why he was happy to have John Truhart um, as as his sidekick because John Truhart was able to cover all those bases to do arrangements, to do charts, to you know, to to to, to organize the, the the members of the band and sure and and so you know he he really didn't have the qualifications. That's why he didn't want to do it. He just wanted to play his drums. Gotcha. But but Ellington talked him into doing it, and and fortunately he went with it because you know he became quite a band leader then. Hmm. Yeah, I mean when you think about it, I mean looking at articles which we'll get to. Uh, you know, a little bit down the road on the timeline. I mean, he was a band leader. He was known as a band leader. He was famous for it. So he 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 really again, he he kind of uh, like excelled at every challenge that was put in front of him. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Then the next the next gig he had was was at the Paddock Club. But unfortunately, that that club went up in, in flames. <laughs> I, I don't know if it was a, an insurance thing or what, but but the the, the club burned down, hmm. and so then uh, Chick then took his band to the Savoy, and there he uh, formed a, a a bond with with Mo Gale, who was the owner of of the Savoy, and with Charles Buchanan, who was the uh, manager of the Savoy, and um, it was there that that he really it, he really took off. Hmm. Because he he was scheduled, uh, uh, Buchanan scheduled him with um, the first band battle. You talked about his his band battles. Mm -hmm. His first band battle was with King uh, King Oliver and Fletcher Henderson, and he both of those were were well established. Especially King Oliver were well established uh, uh, bands, and he it, in the battle he beat both of them. So you know wow. he he. I mean, this this guy is just oozing with talent, you know, he's just, yeah. it's just incredible. Now, what constitutes uh, a battle? Would it be drummer versus drummer? Or is it like, is it like a clap -o meter where who gets the loudest cheer from the audience or, or what? Exactly. Would it's, it's, it's at the end of, it's the end of the evening. The, 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 the audience decides via an audience meter uh, who won the battle. And, you know, it was, it was just a, it was a pairing off process. And uh, first, he he beat uh, Fletcher Henderson, and then uh, the next battle. Then then he had to go up against King Oliver, and you know the audience gave him the victory. Then the next thing, the next big thing that happened to him was he was uh, he was used in a Paramount Lasky Pictures after Seben, 
it's a terrible minstrel show. Yeah. And um, it, it's really kind of sad to see him perform in that. But, you know, hey, it's, it's, you're working your way up to the top. You take you take what you can get, you know. So, yeah, that's that's the first one. And then the second one was was a very short clip of him at the uh, Savoy. And it, it was just a silent clip. And I, I ended up putting it up on on YouTube. Um, I started off with with this uh, with this after Steven, and then I segued into a, a, a short clip of 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 him silent film, but I put it to music mm -hmm. uh, of him of his of his orchestra. Yeah, you know, and, and we're judging it by today's standards. You know, back then, you know, minstrel shows were were commonplace. Yeah, and if if if, if you look at the the, the musicians in his band in, in the Harlem Stompers, if you look at the expressions on their faces, they do not look very happy doing this. But yeah, you know, a gig is a gig, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, all we can do is kind of shrug and go, I guess it is, you know, we, we, we can learn from the mistakes of people in the past and, and, and move forward. Um, but so on the timeline here, which getting, I was about to ask, what about some drums that he's playing? But it looks like we, we're now getting to a point where he's getting his first endorsement with Leedy. His first endorsement is with Leedy, yeah. And um, um, actually, it, <laughs> it, he didn't get much of an endorsement. He's in one of the Leedy topics. It, there's a very short article uh, of him, but, you know, he's, he's not promoted very well within Leedy. The next endorsement was with Frank Wolf drums. And again, the catalogs don't really uh, give him his due. But that set is the iconic set that has that caricature on the bass drum. Yeah. And uh, that was that was a result of, of a guy by the name of Boy Ten Hove, who was a, uh, a cartoonist. And he he did all the uh, old jazz greats. Uh, Artie Shaw, Duke Ellington, um, uh, Louis Armstrong. He has all these caricatures, and Chick liked his caricature so much that he had it put on the front of his bass drum. Yeah, yeah. Which is what yeah. you think of when you when you think of Chick Webb. Is this? It's it's your classic like uh, you know carnival or whatever caricature where everyone's got a big huge chin and huge accented you know features on their face, but boy it's it is good and it's it's he he sells himself really well like his face and he's always smiling obviously he's he means business we know that it's not all just smiles and happiness but like he, he he's putting himself there and and the picture on the bass drum he's got a crown on so he knows that he's <laughs> he's calling himself the king but uh he's he's really he knows how to sell himself he does you're right yeah 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 yeah. The next big thing then to happen to him is, is Ella Fitzgerald. Mo Gale had told him that he really needed a, a singer. Uh, he had Charlie Linton as a singer, but Charlie Linton, if you listen to any of his recordings, he's not a very strong singer. Mm. And um, so he was, he was searching for a singer, and his, his front man, Bardu L.I., went to the uh, Apollo uh, Amateur Night, and he discovered Ella Fitzgerald, and he brought Ella to Chick, and Chick then brought Ella to Mo Gale, and 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 Mo Gale said no way because Ella, not that she was horrible looking, but but she was she was a street person, she was a street urchin, she was a waif, and so you know when when they brought her in, she had she had army boots on and you know an, an old tattered dress, and yeah. so you can imagine bringing her into Mo Gale's office. Mo Gale said, no way. And Chick Webb said, uh, no, you got to don't look at her. Listen to her. Yeah. And he did. And she was hired. Wow. Instantly. I mean, yeah. Chick knows that battle of like, don't look at her. Listen to her. That's the story yes. of his life, really. And that's his story, too. You know, yeah. I mean, don't don't look. Listen. Yeah, and, exactly. And, you know, it, it, it's the same thing. Yeah. It's now, kind of a dual, duality there. Before we move on here, I want to ask you the question about uh, we have on your timeline um, Gladstone Symbol Association. That well, it's it's a hand sock symbol, um, and and Billy developed that. He developed that with the with the Lady Corporation, 
Um, and that's where the association started was, was when Chick Webb uh, was endorsed by, by Liddy. He took a liking to these hand sock symbols. And if you go on uh, YouTube and, and pull up Dog Bottom is the name of the piece, he's actually playing them on, mm. on and that's the only percussion that's on, on the cut is, is are, these, are these sock symbols. They're just handheld symbols that, that you can also play on. And it was beginnings of, of the hi-hat. There wasn't sure. a hi-hat back in those days. And, and so they had low boys and these hand sock symbols. Yeah. Would he then keep that? Like, uh, I'm trying to think of the ease of picking it up and playing and switching. Would he keep that on like his trap table in front of him, basically on kind of on the top of his bass drum and grab it when he needed it and play it? Yeah, yeah, but but um, I, I don't think he played it all that much. I think there's only like two two cuts that I've found on YouTube where he actually where he actually plays them. Yeah, got it. Got yeah. it. Yeah, I, I should say I should have said this at the beginning. Chet is also an expert on Billy Gladstone, so his previous episode is all about Billy Gladstone. So I, I recommend people checking that one out as well, which kind of doves t- dovetails nicely. This is both of your <laughs> your passions coming together. Both of my passions, yeah, exactly. That and Gresh, uh, all three of them: Gresh, Gladstone, and 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 Chick Webb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a it's a lot of Gretch recently. I was I was saying before that like I I, I hadn't done a lot of Gretch episodes. Uh, for a long time, but now we're going hard with Gretsch uh, <laughs> in the in the last couple of weeks, which is great. That's so, a good thing. <laughs> yes. Carry on here. I think we're we're moving on to the Apollo Theater. Ella Fitzgerald uh, shows up for the for the uh, for the audition night for this talent show, and uh, she shows up uh, wanting to be a dancer, but unfortunately, uh, a pair of, of dancers called the Edwards sisters had appeared as the final act. And so the next thing that occurs is this talent show. Well, Ella says, there's no way I'm going to go out there and dance when the Edwards sisters who were, who were very famous dancers in Harlem uh, had just appeared. She says, there's no way I want to sing. And so, you know, the, the stage manager says, you kind of, you, you kind of make rules up as you go here, don't you? And she says, yeah. And, and so she sings and he says, well, what do you want to sing? And she ends up singing, singing the object of my affection and Judy. Hmm. And, uh, as I said, Bardu Li uh, had, 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 was there that night. He heard it and the rest is history. He, he brought her then to, 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 to Chick Webb. Chick Webb brought her to Mo Gale. Mo Gale said uh, no initially, but then when he heard her saying he's done, you know, it, he, he, he wow. said hire. Wow. But then she needed a lot of care and upbringing because, uh, as I said, she was, a, she was a street urchin. And so it was, it was uh, Chick Webb's wife that helped Chick to bring her along and to groom her. Yeah. Now, uh, Chick Webb, you said he was married on his personal life. How long were, you know, any info on his wife and meeting her? Was she a musician as well? Or what, what's the story she was the hostess at the Savoy and not really that much is known about her. Her name is Sally. Okay. Uh, not really that much is, is known about her. Okay. Just to know that he's married. It kind of, yeah, I don't know. That's interesting to know personal stuff like that about uh, someone, because I think Chick Webb, there is information known and there's your great book, which you're referring to. And we'll kind of, plug more at the end but it's really he again is one of those people where he's just referred to and i think people who don't really dig deep into the history of this stuff which now they don't need to because you're telling everyone about this stuff but um it it it, it fills in the picture of of chick a little bit more than just a uh because i think a lot of people don't even know that he was um he suffered that fall down the stairs and he had this back issue i mean unless you are kind of told that you just might think that's an interesting looking guy or some, you know, you, cause you pictures usually see him behind the drum kit. So uh, it's good to fill it out a little bit more. Um, yeah. But, yeah. And, and maybe we check in too. what year is this when we're at the Apollo theater and the talent show and all that stuff? It's the early thirties. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Great depression is sort of uh, underway, I guess at that in point. In full swing. Yeah. 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 All right. So carry on from there. Next big thing to happen then is is um, Ella and a guy by the name of Van Alexander, 
who is one of Chick's arrangers, uh, wrote a tisket a tasket. When when Chick tried to record it, uh, the execs told him the record execs told him, "There's no way you can you're not going to do a, a a nursery rhyme. It just won't sell." And Chick said, "Well, <laughs> either we do it or." I don't record. Mm. And so he stood his ground. And, and, and fortunately, he did because when he, he recorded it, and it was just an instantaneous hit and was number one for 19 weeks wow. on, the, on, the, on the record charts. Yeah. Mm. It's so interesting how wrong record executives and stuff can be because oh. I guess they're, oh. trying to, they're trying to stay with a formula, but the formula has exactly. to change. It, it's, that's the way it goes. Is it's, it's no, we do it this way. Then... Uh, a tisket, a tasket comes out, or something like that that you never think would be successful, and people love it because they haven't heard anything like it. You know, exactly, exactly, yeah. yeah. And he and he's yeah. pulling some weight, man. If he can, if he can make make you know threats, not really a threat, but you know what I mean. Kind of, I'm not going to do it then. Uh, so he's clearly successful, and he's pulling in some pulling some weight. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by Low Boy Beaters. You may be asking yourself, what's wrong with stock beaters? The answer to that is nothing is wrong with them, but pedal manufacturers know they're going to sell pedals to drummers of all genres. So the stock beater has to at least be functional for everything from metal to folk and jazz. But to sound your best, you need a beater that is specifically built for your style of music. If you play punk or metal, you're going to want a wood striking surface. Hip hop or country calls for leather. If you're playing blues, you probably want a felt beater. And the low boy Puff Daddy with a lamb's wool striking surface is great for jazz and Americana tunes. That's why so many of today's top drummers are playing low boy. People like Steve Ferrone, who've played with Eric Clapton, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, and who toured earlier this year with John Mayer. Lester Estelle Jr. from Kelly Clarkson's band is an artist, as is Rasheed Williams, who tours with John Legend. I'm a big fan of low boy beaters. I think they're awesome, and I think you guys will like them too if you haven't checked it out yet. Um, Lowboy is offering 15% off for drum history fans. So you can go to lowboybeaters.com, use code drum history and get 15% off anything on the website. Again, that's lowboybeaters.com code drum history. And you get 15% off his entire site. It's Was he true. financially doing, doing really well at this point? Is that known? I mean, no, no. Hmm. I mean, he was doing okay, but you know, he wasn't setting the world on fire. Yeah. Because this this now uh, is moving towards uh, the the later thirties, um, and he's performing at the, the Paramount Theater. He, that's where the, the Tisca de Tasket was, was 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 initially performed and and did really well, and then it, it just went wildfire all across the country. Interesting. Yeah. Was were recordings like that typically done uh, in a live? situation where the recording of a tisket a task it would, would be recorded live on a theater and then released or would they go in studio i mean i, I no, can't be in studio yeah. yeah okay yeah cool cool and that's that's neat to think of those old days of the recordings and i'm sure it's all one take you know let's just get it all right together and uh <laughs> one pressure. take and interestingly started with a bell huh that's how they started a recording they rang a bell which is kind of odd. I know, isn't that sound yeah, crazy? Yeah, because you think like that is literally the most sharp, ringing, like <laughs> it, it doesn't uh, turn on a light. You know what I mean? Like flip the light switch or whatever, but a bell. Exactly. Wow. But, but a bell. Yeah. Huh. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. I've I, never when heard I found that. that out, I thought that was kind of kind of crazy. <laughs> would They would obviously wait for it to like dissipate. and, and Exactly. Yeah. Okay, that's bizarre. And, you know, they, they, they did a, a wax recording. I mean, they, they were recorded on wax, and yep. then duplicates were made from that wax recording. Sure. So they would pick it up from where, where the music actually starts. Yeah, yeah. Early editing, early trimming, but still, exactly. what a, what a, it's things like that where until someone comes along and says, yeah, we're not doing that anymore. You kind of yeah. just, they just keep doing it and doing it. Why That's, are we ringing a bell? Can't we turn on a light? Isn't that a, yeah. an easier way to cue? To or just, cue say, and- just say, we're recording. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's funny. So Chick is, uh, so he's like in his 20s at this point. So he's, he's a, yes. you know, grown man doing this, working as a musician, uh, again, beating, beating all the odds against him. So, um, you know, he's, he's, he's doing a great job in his life. I mean, that's, that's for sure. Obviously I think he, you said he wasn't being compensated maybe fairly 
as you would be today, but uh, he's making a living, which is good. You know, he's successful. But the odds are catching up with him because uh, with each performance, um, he, he's, his health is deteriorating very rapidly at this point. And in fact, at the Paramount Theater, he had to be carried off stage because Jeez. he was he was bleeding profusely. He was just in, in, in terrible health. He was just really in horrible health at this point. Mm, yeah. It's really kind of sad. It is. I mean, obviously, it's the 1930s. It's not medical. It's not the most medically advanced time in history. So, uh, well, and he, he was also quite adamant about not going to the hospital. In fact, he, he was quoted on several occasions. You go in and you don't come out. I mean, he, he did not want to go into the hospital. He had a bad experience with hospitals as a, as a child. And 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 so he he really didn't take care of himself. You know, no, it's really sad. It is sad. That that makes me think of um, I I think Bob Marley had something similar, and I don't want to get that wrong, but I believe he had like a cut on his toe or something like that, and he would never get it checked out. Would not go to the doctor. And I hope I'm not getting this wrong, but I think that turned into something extremely serious, which. Uh, something small that could have been fixed, but then it just progressed and progressed. But Chick had something very serious from the beginning, uh, which, you know, was kind of his, the albatross around his neck his whole life. Um, mm -hmm. But it's interesting. You you wonder what would have happened if if he he would have gotten checked out. He, he, he may have been right, though. He may They may have said, nope, you're staying here. We're going to put you in a bed and you're done. Well, but, but uh, uh, actually, uh, Mo Gale insisted that he go to the hospital and uh, he, he, he went to the hospital and the doctor determined that th there was a fluid build up in his back. Um, and, 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 and he, uh, he, they drained the fluid from his back and it made it even worse. Oh, so, you know, th this, boy. this poor guy is just, you know, hmm. one bad luck after another. Yeah. Um, but, so he's he, he's he's in very bad health, but he's still battling. Correct. The battles he's, are still going on, still battling, still performing, you know, being carried off the stage at the end of the night. But he's still performing. And that's this is really kind of amazing. Now, yeah. this is like I said, this 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 time frame is, is be very condensed. Um, this is now the, the, the late 30s. And this is when he does battle with with Benny Goodman. And that was in 1938. I mean, he died in 39. So the year before, he's doing battle with with Benny Goodman. Jeez. And uh, th this is a whole new subject to, to talk about here is 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 a, is a, is a Goodman web battle. And there's been much, much said about it. And, um, you know, it, it inevitably the stories tend to grow obviously Krupa was playing with Goodman at the time and 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 there's been many places where you'll see where Krupa is, it, it says that he was never cut by a, a better man and I, I really I'm really not so sure about that I, I really kind of feel like it was Krupa's self-effacing uh, uh, demeanor he, uh, I think he was, he gave Chick a lot of credit. I do believe that the web band cut Goodman, mm -hmm. but, uh, but then again, they were performing at the Savoy, which is, you know, Harlem. And although it was a mixed audience, it was predominantly black. Yep. You know, you, you, there's, there's, there's a video of Norma Miller and, um, and Frankie Manning and, and they talk about, about how Chick routed the Goodman band. And, and, and I don't think he actually routed. He may have defeated them at the Savoy, naturally, because, you know, that's his yeah. home turf. Home right? court advantage, yeah. E exactly, home court advantage, exactly. Hmm. So I think a lot of times, a lot is made of that battle actually more than it it's should than that's actually do. Yeah, and I think actually it's interesting that you, of all people, are saying that because it, it just proves that you've got a good perspective on everything because you clearly love Chick Webb. But I think you understand that something may have been 
you know, he 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 it might have been, again, the home court advantage. He might not have been it might not have been that big of a upset that history lets on. So I'm I'm glad to hear that you're kind of being a little realistic about it might not have been so much of a blowout as people say again, because you're you you're the chick man, but um you're also realistic, which I think is good. Yeah. If if anybody's gonna give Chick the advantage, it would be me. But yes. but 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 I can't I can't really believe that that he that he cut Krupa. You know, maybe Krupa, like I said, he was a very self-effacing person. Yeah. And and he's he's he was just a really nice guy. Yeah. Unlike unlike Buddy Rich, you know, who was kind of a who was kind of an a hole. Yeah, uh, like a, like would not like a bulldog, like wouldn't back down against it. But exactly. It, exactly. It, in that situation, Gene would be the gentleman to go, especially because the guy's clearly in poor health. If he passed away the next year, it's like let him have it. You know what I mean? Be be the bigger man. Not that not that he really we're just we're guessing now, but not that he was like, you know, through the match or whatever, but uh No, yeah. no, by any means. I'm sure yeah. I'm sure he played his ass off. And yeah. and I'm sure I'm sure the crowd were just going crazy for Chick and going crazy for Benny Goodman, too. I mean, Benny Goodman was was the king of swing. I mean, he was the top guy in yeah. the country. I may be wrong, and, and there are people who I know will say that I'm wrong and, and say that, you know, that 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 that, that, that he cut Krupa. But I, I just can't believe that because, <laughs> you know, Cooper was just a, a monster player. Yeah. And so, you know, and, and though that chick was as well. Yes. Um, yeah. It, it, as I said, when, when, we, when we were talking before we started this, I'd like for you to play uh, the cut Liza. You'll hear Chick Webb play. I mean, this is this is like weeks before he died, and and you will not believe the tempo that he plays lies at. Hmm. It's just incredible. It's a live broadcast from 1938. That's that's one of the, the few broadcasts that was recorded live. Um, it's just it's just phenomenal what he what he plays. Also, I should bring up that this was also the time that uh, that Chick got involved with the Gretsch Company. <laughs> he's on the 1939 catalog, the 1941 catalog. He's gone because he's dead. <laughs> Jeez, I know. Isn't that wow. sad? I yeah. mean, it's just yeah. Th- he was just coming to his own when. Yeah, I mean, uh, what, which those what a those story. other those other endorse endorsers he had like Leedy you said he wasn't featured too much which you can't blame Leedy he was he was a younger guy I mean even nowadays yeah exactly uh, a, a exactly. newer drummer wouldn't be on the cover of the magazine I mean they wouldn't do that but um, Gretsch right. as we learned from Lucas in the previous episode big deal I mean it's a big deal company so so was this more of as as far as we know a real endorsement definitely. He's on the cover of, of, of this 1938 catalog. Sure. And, and I think a lot of it had to do also with Billy Gladstone. I'm, I'm sure they must have had a relationship that, that stemmed way back when Gladstone was doing his symbols with, with, with the Leedy Corporation. Yep. Uh, you know, so, you know, there's like 10 years in the making there of, of a relationship. Yeah. And on this Gretsch cover that you're referring to, I mean, he, he just exudes like he, he's cover material. He's got the look. Yes. He's he's doing the, the big like as, as nowadays I think of it as like oh that's a great thumbnail to put on YouTube or something like the little photo exactly. that makes people click it. It makes you want to read. I mean he's got he's just got the style and he's a, such a big huge smile on his face, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, exactly. Well, that's that's a shame, but he so he got some good gear. W- was do you know any details of the endorsement? Was he just here's a new drum set or, you know, how did how did that work? Yeah, he he had that iconic set yep. with the chicks that go around the the perimeter of, of the drum. It's on all four drums: uh, the snare, the tom tom, the floor tom, and and the bass drum. Yep. And and again, for the folks who are listening, it is literally when we're saying chick. I mean, it is a baby chicken. A chick was yeah. his was yeah. his logo, uh, and it would be green, correct? Green. 
it was a, it was a white pearl drum with little green chicks going around the center. And I, I credit uh, John Cohen with that. He he was the one that um, uh, he's another historian. Uh, John was the one that uh, told me that they were they were actually green. The little chicks were green because they're all black and white photos. So yeah. how, how, how do you know what the color was? But but somehow he um, was able to find out that they were they were green chicks going around. Um, which is fascinating. I mean, and, and that's a pretty tall order. I mean, I think if I called Gretsch today and I said, listen, I want a white marine pearl drum set with green little chicks around it. I mean, that's a serious custom order, you know, yeah. like to get that, oh, yeah. that yeah. inlay. I mean, he must have pulled some weight to uh, to get such a, <laughs> a, a, a drum set like that. Exactly. Exactly. But, you know, he was he was top guy. I mean, he, you know, he had this fabulous uh, tisket at Tasket and and he, he was just his recordings. He, he was just a plethora of recordings at that time. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, we are we're getting close to his death, right? I mean, we're we're very close to it. So what what happened? You know, what where where from where we were with the battle with Benny Goodman and, and all that stuff? What what happens from there till the end? Well, he he was playing a, a cruise and he was he was having such a two drummers pitch hitting for him on on many occasions. They would gotcha. have to bring in other drummers to cover for him. Hmm. And he was he was playing a, a, a cruise and um, he, he just could go on no further. And they he went to to Baltimore and he was dead within a matter of days. What was the yeah. official? Was it just due to his ailment that he was he's had his whole life? Yeah, it, well, it was the tuberculosis of the spine, but it was complications of that. I see. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Terrible. I mean, but again, it's terrible. But talk about an amazing life for such a short time. So he was in his 30s, right? I mean, he would have been. Uh, how old was he when he died? He died at age 30. Wow. Another one of those. I mean, he's up there with John Bonham, Keith Moon. You get these famous drummers who just died when they're super young. Those were different situations. This was a serious, I mean, tuberculosis of the spine is a different, he wasn't a party, you know, partying hard and stuff. No, uh, a hard no. lifestyle. In fact, I, I think he led a very, very clean life, which maybe that helped with his longevity that he did have. All right. Well, that's just wild. So I see in some photos that you sent me, there is a what looks like there's someone, uh, Judith, I believe is her name, working on a Chick Webb drum set. Explain the the gear. What what I, what I'm looking at here. Okay, what you're looking at there is I found a Gretsch Gladstone that was uh, painted black, and I didn't know what to do with this drum. I had no idea what to do with it, and I thought, hey, why not make a Chick commemorative drum, a commemorative Chick Webb snare drum, right? Mm. Yeah. So um, I got the, the white pearl and 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 the, and the green sparkle, and I got those from uh, Brooks Tegler, who's uh, another historian. Yes, I, I'm okay at covering a drum, but cutting out these little chicks. My wife is the artist, and I said, "Would you do that?" And so uh, she cut out all the little chicks to to, to paste on this drum, this mm -hmm. snare drum. Um, and then shortly thereafter, um, I was looking at eBay and I saw the, the, the gooseneck cymbal arm set with the bass drum and the rolling console and the trap table. Yeah. And so I, I bid and I got the thing and I thought, well, why not make, I didn't, I didn't want, a, I didn't want to try and recreate the Gretsch Gladstone set because um i just didn't want to do that i wanted sure. the, the 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 set that has the caricature on the bass drum and that's a frank wolf set yeah so what i did was create a frank wolf set but again i needed a, the front head to be painted judith is the artist um she, she she painted the front head yeah um, it, it looks incredible i mean she did a great yeah job which again check I'll, I'll put up the photos um on the the page for this on my website it'll be on the video so folks can kind of click around and, and find that but boy she did an amazing job on that yeah yeah she it's, it's really amazing 
And I will say that you, uh, I think it's something to be proud of here. If this is what you paid for that drum set, that's a pretty good deal. It says like 700 bucks for that that uh, premier Olympic drum kit uh, pre-war. That's a good deal. That was an, an incredible deal. I yeah. was just, I was on pins and needles. I was holding my breath <laughs> that this thing didn't get bid up, right? Yeah. Because you know how those things can go. They can get, they can just get bid to, to yes. astronomical levels. Qu- very know? quickly. I'm sure you were refresh, yeah. refresh, refresh, checking. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. Because I had my limit, you know, and it oh, wasn't, it wasn't much more than what I had put down there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, really as like a, as a fun thing, that's kind of a, homage to one of your you know heroes um you don't want to pay ten thousand dollars for not that you would no. for something like that no. but um that's crazy it, it was meant to be i mean that's just awesome yeah. and then <laughs> so you got that gretch gladstone snare drum it looks like at guitar center guitar right? center boy yeah. did they know what they had you know or was this uh was that a good deal as well well, yeah, yeah, it was a pretty good deal. I ended up paying nine hundred bucks for that, and that was a steal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. You got to know what yeah. you're looking for, which you clearly do uh, from from doing this, because I'm sure people walk and right a lot by of it. luck too. Yeah. In your opinion, why has he become mm-hmm. such a mythical man? Uh, I feel like I know the answer, but just don't want to hear kind of the experts say it because he really is up there with the the legends of drummers, Gene Krupa, Buddy Rich. But we we have so few, like Gene and Buddy were so much more documented, you know? Why do you think Chick is the legend that he is today? Only 30 years old. 30 years old, and look what he accomplished. I mean, that, that, that he, he accomplished in 30 years what takes everyone else a lifetime. Yeah. He was able to do it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Besides and- being... An incredible drummer. I mean, you know, uh, Buddy Rich calls him the granddaddy of them all. Buddy Rich thought thought he was was just the, the the best. Yeah. And there's something about when people die young, it puts them in a legendary status without a doubt. Exactly. No, no denying exactly. that. Um, Especially when they've been associated with people like Ella Fitzgerald. Who you know then lived on for many 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 years and had a had a had a glorious career, but but you know when 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 uh, when Chick died, she was number one uh, in the um, uh, Melody Makers uh, poll for female singer. She was mm. number one, wow. beating Billie Holiday. Mm. Chick dies and she goes to number seventeen. <laughs> Interesting. What do you think yeah. that is? What do you think? Why do you think Be- that is? Because he, she didn't have him to nurture her along, you know. Later yeah. on, then she 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 hooked up with Norman Gantz, and her career just took off to you know just incredible. And you know, I've had people say, "Well, she was such a great singer; she would have made it anyway." Well, not necessarily true. This was during the Depression, you know, and and there were I'm sure there were lots of, of great singers during the Depression that that you know never saw the light of day. Yeah. I think there's something too about musicians where it's not a male female thing, it's not a black white thing where certain musicians need other musicians and they need someone else to kind of help build them up and push them forward and if they don't have that they don't do as well or they don't do anything. Like they they need a bit of a push behind them. Uh and I think that's true today. We all have friends as musicians who you know, you play in a band with a buddy and then the band, you guys kind of stop playing together. You move on to other musicians. That friend just never plays music again. Exactly. We all had that happen. So, um, yeah. yeah, I think that on that note, that is the most true thing I think that we can say about him is is he is an inspirational story. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. A thousand percent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. to. Yeah. If, so, if if it's like, OK, if you have a little bit of uh, I mean, everyone, the drums are not kind to our bodies. Let's let's be real. It, it, you, you get <laughs> it hurts your back. Your wrists might hurt. But I mean, if Chick can do it and he's in the night in the Great Depression, you know, with all everything against him, uh, everything think, against him. Yeah, you can make it work. And shame on you for for, for whining, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. look what this guy was able to do. I mean, shame it, on you for, it's ex- it's for ex- whining about, oh, I didn't get paid enough or I didn't get this or I didn't get that. You know, come on. Are sure. you kidding? <laughs> it's a kick in the pants. Look at look at Chick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, Chet, 
this is just awesome. So uh, do you want to tell people if they want to learn more? Because obviously this is a pretty quick um, overall look at his life. But about your book, tell us about your book a little bit, which people can get. And, um, you know, more information about that masterpiece right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know that, that's a, that it's a masterpiece, but but it, it, it it's something that, 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 again, you did help me a lot with this book as well. What's the best place for people to find the the Chick Web book? Amazon. Amazon. Yeah, that's usually. Yeah. I ask because sometimes like, you know, if I can direct people to their website or wherever to kind of cut out the yeah. middleman, but let's be real, Amazon is probably the best place to get most stuff. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> Awesome. Well, um, Chet is kind enough to stick around and do a Patreon bonus episode today. And we're going to talk about the process of uh, researching a drummer such as Chick Webb, where there might not be so much information. But he had an experience with Van Alexander, who we talked about before, where he got to meet him and learn from him. And he was 99 years old. So I'm excited to learn about that. Um, So if you want to hear that short little bonus episode you can go to drumhistorypodcast.com patreon link and uh you get the this and then a bunch of other bonus episodes uh from people like chet which i'm excited to hear about so Mm -hmm. chet my friend i am so happy to have gotten you on in such a quick amount of time i mean this was like a two-day turnaround and uh my pleasure my pleasure i'm glad we were able to do it exactly where i was going to say lucas he and i talked for like two years before getting him on the podcast so you were (laughs) you were the opposite but uh uh thanks again to lucas for for really kind of he it happened in real time he said you got to get um we were talking it was like you know chet is the man for chick webb and it's like well i'll do an episode with him and here we are it's done here we are (laughs) it's done (laughs) yes awesome chet well thank you so much for being here and i appreciate you you, sharing your knowledge thank you Bart.